Very good to have you with us. I believe you have been stuck out of the country because of lockdown, but you are back and are stuck in your home. Very welcome home. Tell us more about your thoughts and what you've seen play out through the pandemic. Okay, well, the interview that um, that was published in the Vitz magazine, which I think is, is what people have been asking me about this week, was took place at a much earlier stage of the pandemic when we were, it was very clear that people had vastly different responses to what was going on, right? Because what you saw, especially someone like me who was trapped outside the country, um, getting most of my information via Twitter, via the news, via the media, rather than from face-to-face -face interactions with people, what you saw very clearly was an enormous split, right? But on the one hand, you had people who were starving. And on the other hand, you had people who were losing their minds because they couldn't buy rotisserie chicken and take their dogs for a walk and go surfing. That's so true. And obviously, this differential in how people responded to the pandemic, because this is South Africa, was structured to some extent across racial lines. It was also structured significantly along class lines. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have jobs and homes and to have regular incomes experienced the beginning of the pandemic and the lockdown in very different ways. But that seems to have changed quite a lot over the last few months because the economic crisis is biting everybody. So, you know, more recently we've had a kind of a, a, a very knee-jerk response where people from particular political positions have been arguing that overall the lockdown should never have happened and overall the economy is more important than the pandemic. So I think in many ways our responses to this country, and I say this again as someone who was stuck in the UK for a really long time and they have had horrifically high death rates, whereas we've had quite low death rates. I think our response to the pandemic has been filtered through the fact that, you know, we haven't seen the same level of mass death that many other countries have. But at the same time, you know, many of us have lost people. And the fact that so many of us, so many people are capable of going, well, you know, the pandemic's not that big an issue, the economy is more important. And those people are not the ones who have been burying their elders and their contemporaries it suggests again the way that our personal experience of disaster, our personal experience of trauma impacts on how capable we are or even whether we are capable of that looking at a broader social frame. comes in. Yeah, pretty much. The people that you associate with, the life experiences that you have, the background that you come from, the economic situation that you're in, the level of education that you have. Um, the people that you associate with politically, all of these things impact on the way that you respond to something as significant as a major global crisis. It's impossible for us to look at this dispassionately and just follow the science because we will always respond emotionally according to who we are and where we come from. And I should imagine that's where conspiracy theories flourish in this kind of situation. Absolutely. I mean, you, you find this so often that... One of the ways in which conspiracy theories work is they, they, they serve to kind of entrench ideas that we already have, right? So if you are already suspicious about things, if you already feel that something's not right, and someone comes along with a theory or an idea that gives you answers for why things aren't working, very often we find those easier answers to process than the real ones. So it's almost easier to go, well, the entire thing is a, is, is a myth that was cooked up by the pharmaceutical industry and vaccines don't work. It's just another way for Bill Gates to get his claws into Africans. And it's just another made up disease like HIV AIDS, which of course we know now after massive death massive loss of life is not the case. It's almost easier to understand those things than it is to think about the enormous power imbalances, the huge way that the world is structured, the way that the world is structured around inequality, because the system of capitalism and democracy that we live within is fundamentally an unequal system, right? For that to work, some people have to be rich, some people have to be poor. These are difficult things to understand, they're difficult things to process, and they're difficult things to react to. There's nothing that I as an individual can really do about the fact that global capitalism is responsible for unequal responses to the pandemic. But if I believe that the pandemic is completely fake and it was all made up by the pharmaceutical industry, I feel a lot more agency, I feel a lot more empowered, I feel a lot less afraid. So I think this is part of the reason that conspiracy theories take hold so powerfully. They help in, us to times like this. explain the inexplicable. I was um, watching him on CNN and reading about him as well, and I forget his name, sadly, but, but he's a Dutch philosopher who's talking about uh, the impact that the pandemic has had on people, the fact that 
we're losing things like eye contact and hugs and kisses and all of that kind of stuff. With what you've been telling us about your tribe and what we've learned, I mean, with those sort of physical needs removed in a time like this, what do we do with this information? How do we become more human again? Mm, that's a really good question, and it's not one that I can properly answer. I mean, I think, you know, we need to speak to people whose expertise is in psychology to understand this stuff. But one thing that I think is incredibly important is, and it's very difficult to do without human contact, without touch, without eye contact, is for us to keep in mind the, the enormous power, political power and social power of emotions, right? Mm. So emotions are often dismissed as being unimportant. We don't really think about them that much. But if you consider, for example, conspiracy theory responses to the pandemic, these things emerge from fear, right? These tribal responses to pandemics emerge from fear. Fear is an unbelievably powerful emotion that really structures the society that we live in. What is one way of trying to counter an unbelievably powerful emotion? By emphasizing another unbelievably powerful emotion. I think one thing that we can do as individuals is try as hard as possible to hold on to empathy, yes. right? To understand that the difficulty of our position is not unique, that other people's positions are equally difficult, to try and put ourselves in other position, in other people's shoes, to try and respond to what we experience as fear and threat with something other than defensiveness. It's very, very difficult to do. It's very difficult to maintain connections, to maintain emotional connections, to maintain communities when you cannot engage in the way in which we are used to engaging. And Nikki, we're going to have to leave it there. We're running basis. out of time. Uh, it's possibly something that you might experience in your isolation. I hope it passes quickly for you. And fascinating to thoughts. Thanks.